In general, if we were to look at uh, planets in the habitable zone, there are about two dozen that we found across all the missions so far in terms of just small, Earth-like, potentially habitable planets. And the one that I want to draw your attention to here is Proxima Centauri b, because this is actually the closest planet to our own solar system. And I think if you were to ask me what's your favorite planet, this would be it. Because the fact that the closest planet to our solar system is a rocky planet in the habitable zone, that just makes me think that they really, really must be common. Dr. Michelle Tomodoro is one of MIT's rising stars in astronomy. See what I did there? Uh, she's a postdoctoral associate working on NASA's TESS mission. Her work is focused on finding new planets outside of the solar system and using those discoveries to estimate how common different kinds of planets are in our galaxy. She also leads the Quick Look Pipeline team at MIT, uh, which is dedicated to analyzing TESS data to find and characterize exoplanets. Her discoveries of four new planet candidates as an undergraduate student landed her on the Forbes 30 under 30 list for science in 2017. And with TESS, she has discovered thousands more. Our talk today is A Planet Hunter's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, the description, discoveries of exoplanets have exploded over the last couple of decades, and exoplanets are one of the fastest growing fields of astronomy today. In this talk, Dr. Kunimoto will cover how we find exoplanets, how we identify those that are potentially habitable, and how anyone can take part in the hunt, even you, in the comfort of your own home. Without further ado, Dr. Kunimoto. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I just want to make sure people in the back are able to hear me. Awesome, thank you. So the next time you go outside in the nighttime and look up at the night sky, it's a little bit challenging because it's you know, cold, very uh, winter time here. Um, but I wanted to look up at the night sky and consider that our star, our sun, is just one of hundreds of billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way galaxy is just one of billions in the universe. It could be that every single one of the stars that you see actually hosts planetary systems like our own solar system. And these planetary systems are what I'm interested in discovering and investigating. So specifically what I look at are things known as exoplanets. So exo means outer or outside. So exoplanets are planets outside of the solar system. And specifically there's a few key questions that I'm interested in answering. The first one is how common are planets around other stars? Is our star one of the only uh, few stars that actually host planetary systems? Or does every star host planets? How many planets are there in a typical planetary system? And what types of planets are there? If we look at our own solar system, for instance, we already see an incredible um, range of diversity, not just in planet sizes, with giant planets, the gas giants and ice giants, um, and the other reaches of our solar system, and the small terrestrial planets in the interior. But we also see differences in color, in climate, in surface temperature, in atmosphere, in composition. So if we already have this incredible array of diversity in our own solar system, what does that mean for exoplanets as a whole? And that also brings me to the next question, which is, are there other planets like our own Earth? Or are we alone in this universe? And I think this is not just a scientifically fascinating question, but it's also philosophically interesting. Are we alone is probably a question that everybody has asked themselves at one point in their life. And by finding planets that are potentially habitable, these are the very first steps to actually answer this question. So what do I mean by a potentially habitable Earth-like planet? This is going to depend on who you ask, and as, as, a, as a planet hunter, uh, we do tend to take a few assumptions, uh, some very Earth-centric assumptions. The reason for this is we have only a single data point for what a planet that in Earth's life actually looks like, and that's our own Earth. So we're going to make assumptions like we're looking at small rocky planets like our Earth. They have to be able to host uh, liquid water because all life needs liquid water to survive. That doesn't mean that non-Earth-like planets aren't habitable. In fact, Carl Sagan, of course, pioneered uh, an incredible subfield of astronomy known as astrobiology, which kind of married exoplanet science, planetary science, chemistry, and biology to better understand habitability. And he even hypothesized at some point that in the gases of Jupiter, the, the really thick atmospheres of Jupiter, you could have kilometer-long jellyfish-like creatures that float in the gases and are able to uh, survive in the atmosphere of Jupiter. 
So I won't be talking about that kind of stuff today. I'll be really focusing on um, potentially Earth-like planets. So the first kind of basic criteria we're looking for when we're identifying whether a planet is potentially habitable is its size. So as we go to the really, really big planets like the gas and ice giants of our solar system, planets are gaseous, whereas uh, small planets are going to be rocky. So we're looking at specifically rocky planets. But if we go too small, uh, planets are not going to have enough mass to actually sustain an atmosphere. And it turns out the atmosphere that Earth has is extremely important for protecting life from the radiation that comes from uh, the sun and other sources. So let's kind of roughly say that planets that are potentially habitable will have, will have sizes between half the size of Earth's radius up to about 1.5 times. The second uh, key criteria is whether a planet orbits in its habitable zone. Uh, so the habitable zone, you can kind of think of this like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, you don't want it to be too hot because any liquid water will just boil away. It won't be able to exist as liquid water. And you also don't want it to be too far from a star, so the temperature is too cold and any liquid water would only exist in the form of ice. Instead, you want something that is just right. It's not too hot, not too cold, but it can actually support liquid water on its surface. And then the third criteria is the type of host star that our planet's orbit around. Now, if you look at um, the really, really big stars, these are much bigger, much brighter than our sun. They have they have to use so much fuel to sustain that brightness that they basically die too quickly. Um, too quickly on a national time scale is less than a billion years. Um, and this is really because we believe life needs several billions of years to develop, so we need our host star to be able to live that long to allow that life to develop on the planet's surface. On the other hand, uh, stars that are much cooler and smaller than our sun are able to live a lot longer because of that. Um, so there are really good places to look for potentially habitable planets. And uh, these M dwarfs are also about 70% of all stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So if planets can be habitable around these types of stars, they may very well host the most habitable planets that we know of. So better understanding habitability around these stars will be really important. One downside of looking for planets around these stars is because they are smaller and cooler, any planets in the habitable zone have to orbit closer to those stars to have the necessary temperature to have liquid water. And that means that because they're so close to their star, they are completely bombarded by extra radiation that we as humans wouldn't be able to survive. Of course, it doesn't mean that extremophiles or other types of life can't uh, grow to adapt to this extra radiation, but it is something that we kind of have to take into, into account. And then, of course, it would be completely ideal if we were to find a potentially habitable rocky exoplanet around a star like our sun, because this is the one data point that we have that is able to host uh, life. So now we know uh, what makes a star and a planet a potentially habitable, how do we actually go about finding exoplanets? And for this, I'm actually going to dive us back about 5,000 years to our knowledge of the very first exoplanets. Uh, so Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, and Mercury if it's a uh, sufficiently clear night, you can actually see all of these with the naked eye. So because of this, um, there are actually measurements dating back to about 5,000 years ago, and about 2,000 BC was when um, ancient Mesopotamians actually recorded measurements of these objects in the night sky that they noticed were kind of different. They moved a lot differently compared to the faraway stars. And so they recorded these objects as the oldest signs. And despite knowing about these planets for 5,000 years, it wasn't until a few hundred years ago that we finally had telescopes capable of discovering uh, Uranus and Neptune. And this is kind of where we landed. I think most people alive today learned about the nine planets of the solar system in elementary school. Um, I, when I was going through elementary school, Pluto was still a planet, unfortunately, it no longer is. Um, and it wasn't until about the 1950s that people started to announce the discovery of planets outside of the solar system but all of them turn out to be data fluids. Uh, the technology just simply wasn't there yet. And this is because we're not looking for planets that are you know, very close to our, our own Earth. Um, we're looking for planets that are hundreds to thousands of light years away, and we need much more than a backyard telescope to do so. I wasn't, of course, around in these early days of exoplanet hunting, but I do have some colleagues that were, and they've expressed to me how it was such a taboo. Like, you would get laughed out of the room if you said, I can find an exoplanet, or I have an idea to, to find an exoplanet. It was just something that people didn't believe was possible. So all that changed in 1992. Uh, so this was only 30 years ago, and this was the very first discovery of exoplanets. It was made by Alex Wilson and Dale Frail. 
And they used what's known as the pulsar timing method. So remember that we can't just use a simple backyard telescope to find exoplanets. We need to be a lot more creative about finding signs of exoplanets, especially indirectly. So the way this method works is we're going to start with our pulsar. So a pulsar is a pulsating radio star, and it rapidly rotates in its radio waves along its poles. So you can kind of envision it like a lighthouse beacon that's spinning around and around. And every time that lighthouse beacon is pointed at the Earth, we can measure the emission from these pulsars. The time between these, uh, the time it takes for it to rotate is maybe a few milliseconds to a few seconds. And because they are so consistent in how quickly they rotate, pulsars are considered the most accurate clocks in the universe. So let's add a planet into the mix. So it's quite naive to consider a star as completely stationary with the planet orbiting around it. Instead, they both orbit a common center of mass because they're both interacting gravitationally with each other. So what happens is, if a planet is in orbit around a star, the star is actually wobbling very, very slightly around its center of mass. So if we have a pulsar with a planet or some other massive object orbiting around it, at some point in its orbit, it will be just a little bit farther away from the Earth than other points, and those missions will take longer to reach the Earth, and our timing will be a little bit late compared to what we expect. Meanwhile, if it comes around in its orbit and it's a little bit closer to the Earth, it will take less time for those missions to reach Earth, and our timing will be a little bit early. So by measuring you know, when the timing is a little bit early versus a bit late, we can actually tell exactly the, the movement of that star around its center of mass. So because pulsars are so accurate, we are actually able to tell a change in a star's motion caused by something as, as low mass as about 10% of the mass of the Earth. <coughs> now one thing that a lot of people don't actually realize is that a few years before kind of this popularized exoplanet discovery, there was potentially the first exoplanet discovery. The issue is that it didn't receive confirmation immediately. We just didn't have uh, the data or the technology to be really, really confident that these were exoplanets. Um, so these were ev eventually um, discovered in 2002, um, but 1988 was when some people considered the first exoplanet discovery. This was made by a team of, of uh, astronomers at my own university, I'm very proud, and they actually pioneered one of the most successful detection methods to date, which is known as the radial velocity method. So this is the second method I'll be covering. Um, essentially, we start with the same thing. We've got our star, it's wobbling around the center of mass of the system because it has a planet that's pulling on it as it orbits. As that star is moving away from the Earth, the light that's measured from that star is shifted to the red end of the spectrum, and as it's moving closer to the Earth as it orbits, that light is going to be shifted to the blue end of the spectrum. So, those of you who have you know, stood on the side, uh, sidewalk and had an ambulance or a motorcycle or something very loud go by, you know how the frequency of that sound changes as it rushes by you. You could actually measure, based off how much and how quickly that frequency is changing, how fast that object is moving. So it's the exact same thing here, but instead of with sound waves, we're doing this with light waves. So the radio velocity method is really powerful because the changes in the star spectrum are extremely precise. So we are actually able to detect a change in the star's motion of only about one meter per second. So I just want you to consider that. We're looking at things that are tens to hundreds of light years away, and we can detect a change in the motion on the order of about one meter per second with the best instruments today. Unfortunately, that's not quite enough to be able to find an Earth-sized planet in a year-long orbit or in some next star. So the goal of the radial velocity method is to be able to detect a change of 10 centimeters per second, and that's because that's how much the Earth causes our own sun to wobble around its center of mass. So I think that this is, I mean, one meter per second already blows my mind. Uh, 10 centimeters per second, though, is going to be possible within our lifetimes. So there's a lot of different detection methods. I don't have the time to go through every single one. But if you have any questions and want to learn more, you can feel free to ask me about any of these. So after these first early detections from the late 80s and the early 90s, um, again, just 30 years ago, there was a huge explosion. People kind of realized, yes, they exist. Yes, we can find them. We should start to find them. So there were a few dozen exoplanets that were detected by the year 2000, and a few hundred that were detected over the next decade. And a lot of these early detections were mostly planets that were larger than Neptune. Um, so we were kind of seeing that this is the typical planet that exists in our galaxy. And one of the really confusing things was we were finding a lot of examples of hot Jupiters. So these were 
giant Jupiter-sized planets that orbit their stars in just a few days. And of course, this is completely different to what we see in our solar system, where all the giant planets are very far, all the small planets are the ones that are close by. So the very fact that these existed, we didn't think that these would exist, these caused us to change all of our planet formation and evolution theories. One thing you might notice is that there's no small planets in this diagram. It's not that they don't exist, it's that we didn't have the technology to find them. So all that changed with the Kepler was NASA's first exoplanet finding mission, and it was specifically designed to find small um, Earth-like exoplanets in year-long orbits around sun-like stars. And it, not did, it didn't only want to find these types of planets, it also wanted to be able to estimate how common they must be in our galaxy to really place our Earth in context with other planetary systems. So what Kepler did is it used the transit method to find exoplanets. So this is the last one I'll cover today. Um, but essentially, we have our star, and as a planet that's orbiting that star, it'll it'll uh, cover it'll cross that star in front of it, and it'll block a little bit of that star's light. So if we have a telescope that's measuring the brightness of that star over time, what we'll see is a temporary decrease in the brightness every time that planet is blocking some of the light. Now, one of the really great things about the transit method is that it actually gives an estimate of the size of a planet, because a really large planet is going to block a lot of light causing a very deep transit depth, and a really tiny planet is going to block only a little bit of light, uh, causing a shallow transit depth. So if we were wanting to find an Earth-sized planet transiting a sun-like star, we would need to build a telescope that's capable of detecting a change of brightness of 0.008% of that star's brightness. But just to kind of put this into perspective, I want you to consider the Empire State Building. Let's say it's the dead of night, all the windows are open, all the lights are on, and for those of you who haven't seen it in person, this the Empire State Building has about 6,500 windows. So one person is standing next to a window and they close the window shade by just a few inches. And you need to detect that change of brightness from over 100 miles away. And now consider that a transit event is only going to happen for a few hours. And if you're trying to find an Earth-like planet orbiting that it takes a year, that event is only going to happen once a year. So you basically need to train your telescope on a lot of stars simultaneously, consecutively for years and years and years just to be able to find a few transit events. And that's what Kepler did. So Kepler observed 150,000 stars for four years consecutively. And the reason it looked at so many stars is because we have no idea how common Earth-like planets are. If they're rare, then hopefully by observing a lot of stars, we can, we can find at least a few examples of other Earths. And if they're really common, then this will give us a huge sample that we can later investigate further. Now, Kepler, at the time, um, had a really large field of view for a typical telescope. Um, 115 degrees squared is about the size of space that you would cover if you were to hold your hand at arm's length. Um, so it's, the, it's the, the sky that you cover with your hand. At the time, it was the largest mirror ever sent into space, with a diameter of about 1.2 meters. It was also the largest camera system ever sent into space, so really revolutionary. And just to give you a sense of how revolutionary Kepler was, this is a plot of uh, planet detections per year. Um, so you can see, you know, there was kind of a few, few dozen uh, by the turn of 2000, and then we had a few hundreds found over the, over the next decade. All the red plots are those that were only found by Kepler. So already Kepler was, was doing really, really well. Um, in 2014, they released the first major catalog of exoplanets. And they kind of blew everybody out of the water. <laughs> so this was just in 2014. They had a few others in 2016 and 2017. And so far, Kepler has found about half of all confirmed exoplanets that we know of today. So just to give you another sense of how revolutionary Kepler was, this is that plot I showed you before. And as you can see, you know, most planets are larger than Neptune. We had a lot of examples of hot Jupiters. And Kepler just completely changed the landscape of what the simple glass planet is. So no longer do we believe most planets are larger than Neptune, we now believe that most planets lie in between the sizes of Earth and Neptune. Which is actually interesting because our solar system doesn't have a planet like that, so that's an open question we still don't have the answer to. So after its four year uh, long mission, it confirmed about 2,400 planets, and another 2,400 planets have not yet been confirmed, but we still have high confidence that they are real. So it was incredibly successful and completely changed the way that we saw exoplanets. Unfortunately, it actually was supposed to last for quite a bit longer, um, but there were some instrumental failures that cut its mission short at four years. 
The telescope itself was in working order, so it was rebranded as K2, um, and K2 was found in several hundred more planets. 2018 is when Kepler finally shut down officially. It was out of fuel. Um, and actually, it was almost exactly four years ago, I think, to the week. And somewhat poetically, the, the very night that Kepler was shut down was one day off of the anniversary of Johannes Kepler's death. And of course, that brings us to the present day. Uh, so Kepler was the past, TESS is the present and the future. So TESS is a NASA mission that is the follow-up to Kepler. It's the <coughs> second exoplanet finding mission. It was launched in 2018. And TESS, rather than like Kepler, where it's looking at 150,000 stars in the same section of the sky for four consecutive years, TESS is actually an all-sky survey. So it's looking at all nearby bright stars for signs of exoplanets. That means it's actually observing tens of millions of stars and really opening up uh, the diversity of plants that we can discover. So this is kind of a mosaic of the sky coverage that Tess is looking at. This is from our prime mission, and as you can see, it's kind of looking at these strips of night sky at a time. So whereas Kepler looked at kind of that single section of the sky covered by your hand held at arm's length, Tess is looking at just enormous strips of the sky for 27 days at a time before rotating, look at the next section of the sky, after an entire year of that, it's covered roughly one hemisphere of the sky. Um, so here you can see the first year was covering the southern hemisphere, and then the second year it flipped up and looked at the northern hemisphere. Um, so this is, this is the result of about two years. The first two years, uh, we recently finished four years, and we've now uh, officially begun our second extended mission, which will last for the next three years. <laughs> And TESS actually is based here at MIT, so um, one of my roles as a TESS postdoc is to lead the Cook Look Pipeline team, which are MIT's planet search efforts. So we take all that data, so if we go back here, every single one of these stars that you see in this image has measurements. We have measurements for the brightness of those stars. So we are able to find exoplanet transits around hundreds or tens of millions of stars. So basically what I do a lot in my day job is, you know, we look at uh, light curves, we produce light curves for a lot of stars. We run automated searches to try to find examples of these transits. Um, we actually look at, really try to dig deep into whether or not these are real, these are caused by planets. And as a result, we have found um, about 268 confirmed planets. And just yesterday, we uh, surpassed 6,000 candidate exoplanets. So, so far, we've found uh, more planets than, than Kepler found. And we have a very bright future ahead of us. I've also predicted, based off of how many planets the test has found so far, that by the end of our next extended mission, which will again be the next three years, the test should be able to have found about 12,000 new exoplanets. And just to compare where tests kind of stands with Kepler, again, Kepler, because it was looking at, at kind of a smaller number of stars, but for a much longer than TESS is looking at stars for a given amount of time, uh, TESS, Kepler was really able to dig down into the noise and look for smaller and smaller exoplanets. Whereas TESS, its specialty isn't so much small exoplanets, but kind of the really big, easy ones that you can find with very little data. So as a result, I think they're very complementary. Kepler with the small demographics, TESS with the giant planet demographics. And just as of this morning, uh, we have about 4,000 planets that have been confirmed uh, from transiting me transit method alone, and that's out of just over 5,000 confirmed exoplanets overall. And again, this is not including the 4,000 or so candidate planets, uh, 2,000, sorry, 2,000 plan candidate planets from Kepler and roughly 6,000 candidate planets from TESS. So there's a lot more that we, we can learn about. Now in terms of exoplanet diversity, I already mentioned those kind of exotic signals of hot Jupiters, which are those giant exoplanets that are really, really close to their stars that are already alone cause us to rewrite our planet formation and evolution theories. We've also found examples of stars that orbit not just one, but multiple stars. Um, we love to refer to those Moon planets after Star Wars. And of course, these were in science fiction well before we ever realized that they were reality. We also found examples of rogue planets, which don't actually orbit any star at all. So how did they form? How did they come to be like this? Um, th this may have been the result of enormous dynamical interaction that stripped planets from their original planetary systems. And at the moment, they're just free-floating through the, the galaxy. Based off the composition measurements of some planets, we've also found that some planets are composed entirely of diamond. So I know that there's you know, issues of, of uh, asteroid mining. Maybe in the future, there'll be 
about climate mining as well. And one of the uh, really exciting things that I think we found so far is the TRAPPIST-1 system. So why I want to highlight this is it's seven rocky planets in a very, very compact orbit. So on the top there is just showing the configuration of TRAPPIST-1, and on the bottom is the TRAPPIST-1 system in relation to a solar system. So you can see that TRAPPIST-1 is, is really, really tiny compared to the solar system. All the planets orbit within the orbit of Mercury. But what's really exciting is that it has three planets that are rocky and in the habitable zone of their star. So this will be one of the most important systems uh, to further investigate in terms of better understanding planet habitability. In terms of the planet that is most like the Earth so far, that will probably uh, fall to Kepler-452b. So Kepler-452b was discovered by the Kepler mission. It orbits the exact same type of star as our Sun, a G2 type star. Its year is 385 days long compared to the Earth's 365 days. And it's just a little bit bigger than the Earth, only 1.1 times the size of Earth. So probably of all the planets we've found so far, this is the closest Earth 2.0 that we've seen so far. In general, if you were to look at uh, planets in the habitable zone, there are about two dozen that we found across all the missions so far, in terms of just small, Earth-like, potentially habitable planets. And the one that I want to draw your attention to here is Proxima Centauri b, because this is actually the closest planet to our own solar system. And I think if you were to ask me what's your favorite planet, this would be it. Because the fact that the closest planet to our solar system is a rocky planet in the habitable zone, that just makes me think that they really, really must be common. So what's next? Let's say we find a, habitable, uh, a planet in the habitable zone, and it's rocky, everything looks good. How do we then determine whether or not it is actually habitable? So one of the things that we can do to kind of start answering that question is understand its composition a bit better. So remember from the radial velocity method, this depended on seeing the uh, gravitational interaction of a planet on a host star, causing it to wobble around that center of mass. So with the radial velocity method, we can understand how massive that object must be to cause our star to wobble. The transit method, meanwhile, gives us a planet size because the big planets are going to block more light than the little planets. So if we can follow up a planet with both methods, we have radius from transit, mass from radial velocity, combine those two to get a planet density, and that tells us the composition of an exoplanet. So if we find that the density of the planet is consistent with an Earth-like, rocky, iron-rich composition, then that's a really good that, that is Another thing that I think is kind of really kicking off just right now, which is why this is an incredibly exciting time to be a part of exoplanet science, is we now have the technology to actually peer into an exoplanet's atmosphere and tell what molecules that atmosphere is consisting of. So the James Webb Space Telescope, is uh, that was one of its major goals, was to be able to do this for planets as small as our Earth. We haven't had the technology to do that until now, but JWST has made that possible. So essentially, we can use uh, this te technique known as transmission spectroscopy to actually pick out different molecules in a planet's atmosphere. This can include water, methane, carbon dioxide, oxygen, biosignature gases that could indicate the presence of life or of water on the surface of that planet. Now, water has been found in a lot of planet atmospheres. In fact, it's one of the most common molecules that has been found so far. That alone isn't going to be enough to say that a planet is habitable, but astrobiologists are trying to come up with theories that could explain, you know, is there a certain combination of biosignature gases that can only be explained by some biotic process that must be life? It can't be any other um, abiotic chemical process. So the last part of my talk is, I've shared a lot about planet discoveries, and um, incredible discoveries have been made that have completely shaped how we view exoplanet diversity <laughs> and place you know, planet formation theory um, in context. And all of those discoveries can actually be made by anybody. You don't need a professional degree, you don't even need programming experience, and I'm going to show you how. Uh, so for the first one, it does require the <laughs> programming experience. Uh, so this one, all of Kepler data and test data is actually free to download on the internet. So all you need is an internet connection and a somewhat large hard drive to download it all. Um, test is specifically is really trying to push getting community involvement. So our data is available to the public just a few days after we receive it ourselves. There's no proprietary period, um, so there's no um, there's no uh, privacy really. Uh, we really want people to be using this data and making some incredible discoveries. There's also numerous resources on the internet for 
setting up your own planet search. People have already written all the code to do this. Um, and there's a ton of tutorials. And I think because exoplanet hunting has been you know, such a fast growing field, people are really encouraging others to get involved. Now this method is one that just requires an internet browser. So the Planet Hunters Test Program is a citizen science initiative. And the idea behind uh, Planet Hunters is that humans have a remarkable ability for pattern recognition and some, in some cases can recognize patterns even better than an automated computer algorithm. So what they've done is they post test light curves, real test data on their website, and just by eye, you can see if you, sign, if you, if you can find uh, signs of exoplanet transits. So the basics are all you really need to know is what a transit looks like, which is just kind of that U-shaped uh, temporary decrease in brightness. And if you think you spot something, you can let other people know, you can you know, work with other people around the world, um, high school students, general public, uh, undergraduate astronomers, professional astronomers, all kinds of people have used this resource. And planet hunters have actually found hundreds of planet candidates that were missed by the test team or the Kepler team. And some of these are some of the most interesting planets that we've found so far because they have very interesting features. Um, they've also just found type, types of light curve variability, not necessarily exoplanet related, but astrophysics related. Um, that is kind of, we haven't really seen variability like that before. And it can only be a human that looks at it and says, this looks weird to me. We need to find out what this is that is inspiring these kinds of investigations. So just some last thoughts as I wrap up here. The first one is just, again, exoplanet hunting has absolutely exploded in the last few decades. Um, 30 years ago was the only the very first exoplanets that we found. Most people have gone through their lives without, you know, the, when they were in elementary school, we didn't even know exoplanets could be found, and now we know of thousands. And there's a lot of um, missions in the future that are kind of keying in on this fact that exoplanets are such an exciting and fast-growing field. So PLATO is going to launch later this decade. Um, PLATO is a European Space Agency program uh, that is going to try to do something like Kepler, where it's finding potentially habitable rocky exoplanets around some like stars. Um, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope is a NASA mission that is primarily going to be cosmology related, but recognizing the importance of exoplanets, it's also going to be uh, attempting to find exoplanets with a different method known as microlensing. And uh, Roman is actually expected to find over 100,000 exoplanets. So we are really just getting started. And as we find all of these examples of incredible planets, our perspective of planets is constantly changing. The very first discoveries of hot Jupiters caused us to rewrite all of our theories. Um, Tatooine planets have, have you know, inspired thoughts about how potentially how the whole planet could orbit two different stars because the habitable zone would be constantly changing and evolving with time. Um, and also we found so many examples, dozens of examples, of potentially habitable rocky exoplanets in the habitable zones. And we are finally at the point of technology where we can start to peer into the atmospheres of these planets. And I think over the next few decades, we're really going to be able to detect you know, liquid water and really get an incredible sense of how common planets like our own Earth are and potentially find the first examples of extraterrestrial life. And what I love about exoplanets is it really feels like making science fiction reality. Um, so many science fiction series, like Star Trek is what inspired me to go into astronomy, and in the 1960s they talk about you know, seeking out new life and new civilizations and boldly going where no land's gone before. And all of the planets that they talked about, that, that was in a, a world where there were no exoplanets that were known. And we've really made science fiction reality, and these are just some kind of clickbaity headlines that I grabbed, you know, finding water in exoplanet's atmosphere, but this is yeah, this, this is the, the world that we live in today, and it's really exciting. And there are a lot of exciting discoveries to be made, and anybody here can take part. I hope you uh, check out the Planet Hunters Initiative and contribute some new plant discoveries. And that brings me to the end. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Kunamoto, for um, an awesome talk. I'm sure I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience has, too. Um, before we start the Q&A, so uh, you can either just, I guess, answer your, um, sorry, like, say your question and project or come down here with the mic. Uh, I want to plug our next event. So our next event will be happening in early January, uh, I mean, sorry, early December, uh, December 8th, 
And the title is 30 Arguments Against the Existence of God, Heaven, Hell, Satan, and Divine Design, with the author of the book of the same name, Jonathan and his peers. So, different flavor, but uh, we hope you come by. And so, do you have any questions? The uh, mic is here. What is the naming convention for the planets that are discovered? So the question was, what is the naming convention for the planets that are discovered? Uh, there's two different things. The first, which is the default for all planets, it's very boring and technical. They're named after the stars they were found around. So, for instance, if you know, uh, Kepler found a lot of planets, so if the star is called Kepler 52, the first planet would be Kepler 52b, and the second planet would be Kepler 52c, and just alphabetically from there. Uh, so there's, there's kind of those uh, conventions like that. Occasionally, the inter International Astronomical Union actually calls votes for specific names that they can place planets of particularly high importance, like maybe they had historical importance or um, scientific importance. And in that case, people can contribute ideas for names that are, you know, a lot more science fiction y, <laughs> a lot more inspired and creative. But that typically happens for only very few planets, very select. Um, what do we know about the magnetospheres of the exoplanets and the stars that they orbit, and what implications does that have as far as habitability? Yeah, so the question was, um, what do we know about the magnetospheres of planets, and how that affects the stars that they orbit, and also what implications that has for habitability? Yeah, so this is, those types of observations are able to be made for select types of planets. Um, I think that because we take such an Earth-centric assumption of what habitability means, we do tend to sometimes lock ourselves into, you know, if it looks too different from the Earth, then we don't expect life should be able to evolve. But I, as I said, um, astrobiologists are you know, digging into examples of how life would be able to exist on planets with very, very different environments uh, like, like those. Um, and there are examples, of course, of extremophiles on Earth that live in completely different environments than we do and are still able to survive. So who's to say that that can't be possible um, with planets that have very, very different spheres? Yes? Can you say the primaries of all those people looking for exoplanets like, is to find life, or are there other, other conditions? Yeah, the, the question is, um, is the primary goal of finding exoplanets to, to find life. And I would say that that, that is. If you were to look at um, priorities you know, listed by, by NASA or you know, the various mission directorates, um, a very, very common sentiment is better understanding of habitability to search for life. And exoplanets are one, finding exoplanets are one very important way that we get there. Um, by better understanding um, you know, how common the like planets are, um, that that helps us even better design future missions that are trying to find more. Um, Kepler, unfortunately, because its mission was was cut short, it wasn't quite able to find a really great sample of Earth-like planets that it than it would have liked to. Um, but based off of what Kepler found, we kind of do estimate that about all sun-like stars have at least one planet in the habitable zone. So hopefully, future missions will be able to find a lot more. How was the uh, rogue planet discovered? The one that was just like floating like out there? Yeah, so rogue planets are interesting. Um, and this, this <laughs> the same planet uh, definition, the International Astronomical Union, that, that says Pluto isn't a planet, they would also consider rogue planets not a planet because they don't orbit a star. <laughs> Anyways, that's getting into a whole lot of can of worms. Um, so rogue planets uh, have been discovered using a technique known as microlensing. And it's I think one of the more complicated techniques because it requires knowledge of Einstein's theory of relativity to find exoplanets. Uh, so let's see if I can do this. Uh, so let's say um, we have a star in the middle and a star right behind it. Um, this is known as a lensing star. You can think of it like a big magnifying glass. If this if this uh, background star happens to align exactly with our lensing star, the light from this star will bend around your your. Um, lensing, and you'll see a magnification of the brightness of this star. If so, we call that a lensing event. If this star happens to have an extra little planet nearby, um, you'll see a smaller microlensing event to the mass of, of your planet. 
So in the case of a rogue planet, it's not a star that's, that's lensing, it's just a free-floating planet mass that's, that's causing a lensing event. Um, in these cases, I think they have to be pretty big planets to be able to produce a lensing event that's, that's detectable. But that's, that's essentially how we, how we know they exist. Thanks. Yes. You know, in the current environment of everybody creating their own realities, you know, in the past, you know, if you found life at a different place, there'd probably be a lot of acceptance of it. But nowadays, do you think that if you were to find a planet and actually determine through your analysis that there could be life on that planet, do you think that you might be, like, hunted down and killed by certain parts of our society? I mean, the, the acceptance of this, you know, is probably going to have a problem to some extent. I do think it's healthy to have some especially when making such a big claim as we found life. You really have to dig into all possible explanations before I think claiming something that is that profound. Because it would be really profound. Um, I know that sometimes I wonder like how how people will just react to that. Um, it's it's kind of getting into like cultural interaction instead of just purely scientific because uh, I think science scientists will like really try to make sure that they've explored all avenues um, and yeah I don't, I don't yeah, but I know I, I'm just thinking that you know like you know back when Galileo determined that uh, you know the planets were moving around and they were rotating around the sun he was excommunicated yeah. and yet on his he said yet they move so you know I mean it's the same thing we're kind of getting getting into that kind of environment again yeah. Denial of reality kind of thing. We'll see what happens. <laughs> you might need a guard. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the live uh, from the live stream chat. So um, we have two of them uh, so far. One is from Ash K. Uh, what are the issues you mentioned with asteroid mining? <laughs> that was a, a throwaway comment. <laughs> well, I think just in general, sustainability um, is, is some, we have you know so much space junk that's in in our in our lower Earth orbit because you know satellites and telecommunications. And I think when something like asteroid, asteroid mining starts, you know there are questions like who has authority over whose asteroid you know, belongs to the corporations and. So it's not just a question of sustainability in terms of how we can best protect our, you know, the environment around our Earth, but it's also a political question about, you know, the business of it all. And I think that we have to really think carefully about policies regarding asteroid mining before it, yeah, happens. Thank you. And uh, the second question is from uh, Tom what methods do we use to confirm whether a candidate planet is really habitable? We can't say for sure whether planets yet are actually habitable. Uh, so I try to be careful to say potentially habitable or in the habitable zone. Um, I, I think a lot of ways we need to start to answer that question, though, are just you know actually understanding does liquid water exist on the surface of that planet. We aren't yet able to say that. Um, so that's why you know looking at Earth at, at planet atmospheres will be a really first a good step to, to kind of pin that down. So yeah, we we don't we're not able to confirm yet whether another planet is habitable, but we can definitely take steps to better characterize planets and have a better understanding of what that the conditions would be like on the surface. I think somebody asked previously about like whether or not an exoplanet had a magnetosphere. So are there any like techniques you can that like you can you can do to assess whether a planet has a magnetic field or not. Yes, but I it is beyond my by my level of expertise, so I I won't embarrass myself by trying to explain them. <laughs> but yeah, there there's there's a lot of ways you can do that. I think by looking at the interaction with the, the host star itself. Oh, but that's limited my expertise. Yes. What's the maximum number of planets found in the planetary system? Are you doing a distribution? Yeah, it's... 
challenging because surveys are very biased. For instance, Kepler observed stars for four years, which means we can't really find planets with periods that are longer than four years. So when looking at just, you know, 400 day periods or less, I think there have been systems that have been at least six planets large. Um, I'm pretty sure it's bigger than that. I don't know the exact number. Not more than 10, but again, that's just because we, we don't have the sensitivity to really map out like a solar system like a uh, planetary system. So I'm sure that all you know really high multiplicity systems exist. We just don't have the, the a, not a single survey is able to find all of those yet. Yes? Um, for improving your ability to serve in the future, um, how much are you limited by the requirement to launch new and better hardware to save resources, improving like data analysis and algorithms here on Earth? Yeah, it's it's interesting because both are really useful. Um, yeah. In fact, uh, as a member of the Google Pipeline team, I'm constantly you know trying to think of ways to improve our data analysis techniques. You know, the telescope is up there. Uh, we can't change the hardware, but we can change the way that we look at the data. Um, so one thing that hasn't been totally, I think, taken advantage of in a lot of data analysis circles is the use of uh, GPUs for programming. So a lot of people typically use CPUs, which are really good at taking like single complicated problems, whereas GPUs have better processing, parallel processing power, so they're really good at doing like the same thing over and over and over and over again. So based off of some testing that I've done, we might be able to speed up our planet search algorithms by a factor of about a thousand, just by switching to consumer grade GPUs. Our biggest um, uh, competitors for GPUs actually for a while were the Bitcoin miners. <laughs> um, and thankfully that's kind of died down, so we are able to, to like order some GPUs and see to see how that works with the test. Um, I think in terms of hardware, there there are actually yeah, there, there, there have been changes to test, even though it's launched, we can also change the software for test mission. So one example is when we initially you know, launched, we had kind of expectations for how much data could be stored on the telescope before we had to send it all down to Earth. And as we kind of actually used the telescope, we had a better understanding of those limits. And as a result, we realized that we could actually store much, many more frames, like pictures of the sky, um, in the same set of time. So we used to take pictures of the, Talk back off. Of, uh, the sky coverage every 30 minutes, and we've, we've actually narrowed it down to every 200 seconds. Um, just like really pushing the limits of the, the hardware capability of the test mission, of, of the test satellite. Um, I think that mission design is really important for designing future missions. Like, do we want to focus on quantity, so looking at a lot of stars, or quality, focusing on a few stars, but with incredible precision to find the smallest exoplanets? And there aren't any clear answers to, you know, which one is better. I think we probably need both. Like, Kepler versus TESS has kind of shown that we need, you know, they really complement each other. Um, so... Kepler's gone, right? Yeah, Kepler's, Kepler's gone. I mean, TESS has... It, we're not able to push push it that uh, that deeply, uh, just because we would need much bigger cameras, bigger uh, primary mission, primary uh, diameter cameras to actually have the light collecting power that Kepler did. So that is the only of the hardware that was chosen. But it was made that decision was made so that we could specifically look at millions of stars in the local neighborhood instead of just a single set of 150,000 stars. So you know, because of that decision, we've discovered planets around incredibly diverse stellar uh, samples that Kepler never looked at. Uh, related to that, uh, so planet hunters uh, relies on the human ability to recognize visual patterns. Uh, computers have gotten a lot better at that over the last few years. So the kind of things still relevant and also do we see that um, for this kind of data analysis? Machine learning is kind of taking over <laughs> a lot of the data analysis circles, both from the perspective of uh, planet searches as well as uh, the analysis of planet candidates once you've actually found them. So, yeah, machine learning is definitely getting there. I think it's, it's I would say it's kind of in the early stages. There's a lot more improvements that can be made, but the implications of machine learning have significantly expanded. Um, I, I still think that's why you need the GPUs then. Yeah, the GPUs 
in our case, they're not going to be used for machine learning purposes. They're still going to be uh, uh, more standard uh, final search algorithm. Um, I think that there's still something to be said about the human ability to recognize when things are anomalous. Um, I know there are machine learning networks that can that can work on anomaly detection, but I think those are in kind of much more early stage. Um, they're not quite able to recognize when something looks like really weird and classify it. Um, and a lot of humans have taken some incredible strides at identifying like, really, really weird light curves. Um, I don't know if any of you remember, I think this was maybe 2015, um, there was a, this light curve that had been observed by Kepler uh, called Tappy Star, and it had these wild variations that were you know, quasi-periodic, but like, people couldn't really understand. Like, there was no type of variability that, that we understood that could explain a system like this. And one of the hypothesized explanations was that there was a Dyson sphere that had been constructed around the star, <laughs> causing these incredible changes in brightness. And that light curve was actually picked out by one of the uh, the capital version of that. So if we had designed an automated method to look through those, maybe we, we would never even realize that that's how we start with the thing. Yeah. Do you use different, to co like confirm, you know, like each of the different methods, do you look at the same stars and confirm them with the different methodologies and say, yeah, that's definitely a planet? Yeah, so there's, there are different tiers of planet confirmation. The absolute gold standard is to be able to have a radius from the transit method and a maximum radio velocity method. So to be able to look at the same planet with two different methods gives us a lot more confidence that these are this is a real planet. And also by getting um, estimates of the radius and the mass, we can understand like the actual properties of that planet and show that it is not a, a stellar companion. Um, sometimes it's not possible to follow up something with the transit method. So for instance, if we have our star, if it orbits like this, it will never transit the star. That doesn't mean the planet doesn't exist, but it just it won't transit. So we can only have one method to find that planet. So in that case, we have to use different methods to at least, you know, if we can't confirm the planet itself, let's, let's statistically show that all the other possible explanations are just so unlikely that we're 99% confident that this is a real planet, then we can consider it statistically validated. So there's there's different tiers of confirmation. We try to distinguish those by calling a firm planet versus validated planet versus candidate planet, just to show our level of confidence and how we came to a decision that this was, this was an actual planet. Sorry, we have a question from, um, from the live stream. From Alex Chan. why does the test only look at the same place for 27 or so days and not more. Uh, yeah, that's a good question why 27 days was picked. I wasn't there in the earliest days of the transmission when we were deciding this, but I think it's. Um, Right, sorry, it's it's actually a consequence of the test orbit. So the test takes 13.7 days to orbit around the Earth. Um, so twice that is enough time to give you 27 days of test situations. And then it, I think the decision to move to the next section of the sky after 27 days rather than repeat that process is just to get more data for a, a more uh, diverse set of stars. So it's worth remembering that there are sections where those like those observations actually overlap. So if you if you looked at those um, those kind of strips of the sky, they actually overlap as you get closer to the ecliptic poles. So some stars get as much as 350 days of consecutive observations in a given year, um, whereas most stars get more than 27 days. But we're constantly revisiting the same stars um, in the night sky to get. You know, longer observing baselines, more data for these stars. So there's you know there's no reason to think that we'll only ever visit each star at a single time. Yeah, it's a good segue to my question. I was gonna ask for the area where the test sectors overlap. I think that overlaps with the James Webb continuous viewing zone. And I know there were plans that, that would allow Webb to look at some of the best test candidates. I was wondering now that Webb has been up a while, has anybody been looking at TESS candidates and have yeah. been interest? TESS is a significant contributor to the list of planet candidates, planets that, that, that JWS is. I don't know the exact number, but it is a significant fraction. 
Um, and we're still continuously adding to that list of really good GWS targets, um, especially for those that are around Amcor, which, um, again, you know, those are the kind of small, cool stars that are a good places to look for habitable zone planets because they're just easier to find and the transits are going to be a lot deeper. And so using transmission spectroscopy with JWST is going to be uh, easier to do. All right, guys, we're going to uh, cut the Q&A a little bit short because we have refreshments to serve, specifically apple pie and uh, virgin cosmos, so like the non-alcoholic version of the cosmopolitan cosmos. See what I did there? Yeah, all right. All right, you want to get this up? <laughs>